Yeah, thanks uh, for the introduction and uh, welcome <clears throat> to my talk, which results from a joint project with Professor Lars Diening, where we design and analyze numerical schemes for parabolic problems. And in this talk, we focus on the heat equation, which is uh, which should be well known. We have some uh, time space cylinder Q, which equals some bounded time interval I times some bounded Lipschitz domain omega. We have some right hand side F that is a square integrable with respect to the entire time space cylinder and we have some initial data, which is in L2. Moreover, we assume homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions on the lateral boundary. Now we want to approximate the solution and we do not apply a classical time marching scheme. We apply a so-called space-time finite element method. And this is a yeah, rather new approach, uh, which basically works as follows. Uh, we characterize the solution U as a unique functions, function in some space X that solves such an variational problem for all functions in some test space Y. And if we have such a variational formulation, we can now apply strategies which are well established for time independent problems to approximate the solution U. In particular, we can replace the continuous spaces, uh, finite, infinite dimensional spaces X and Y by finite dimensional subspaces X, H, and Y, H, which leads to a finite dimensional problem, which is uh, hopefully well posed. So, um, as a result, we get a very large linear system of equations, which is, however, in contrast to time stepping schemes, well suited for parallelization. Um, another advantage of the space time plan is that it leads to quasi optimal uh, approximations. Quasi optimality means that the error of our approximation is bounded from above by a constant times the best approximation error. In contrast to time stepping schemes, where we very often just get a uh, rate optimality, which is nice, but but it, but it's weaker. And it says that the error is bounded from above by a constant times the maximal mesh size in space direction plus uh, the, the maximal mesh size, uh, the maximal time step plus uh, the ratio of these two things uh, to certain powers, where the powers depend on the regularity of the solution. Um, Somehow related to this quasi-optimality result is adaptivity, which says that we want to refine our underlying triangulation uh, in places where the solution is singular in order to capture the singularity better. And with space-time, we can apply this adaptivity in space-time, locally in space-time, in contrast to time-stepping schemes, where we can also apply adaptivity, but in space or in time, but not in space-time. Uh, so this motivates the application of the space-time FEM. However, the design of suitable uh, methods is very difficult. First of all, we need a well-posed variational problem, which is indeed not that difficult to design. Well-posedness in particular requires the so-called Imsup or Ladyshanskaya babushka bretzi condition, which says that the infimum over all test functions over the supremum over all function uh, ansatz you know, sorry, uh, infimum over all ansatz functions over the supremum over all test functions of this ratio is positive. If we have such a well posed variational problem, we have to find discrete subspaces X, H, and Y, H, which satisfy the discrete version of this MSUP condition with a constant which is uniformly bounded away from zero. If this is uh, true, then it leads together with a uniqueness condition to the well posedness of the numerical scheme and the best approximation property, or the quasi best approximation property. However, if you look in the literature, if you check the literature, you will realize that people really struggle with finding these spaces which satisfy the discrete condition. And therefore, they replace the norm in the space, in the ansatz space, by some weaker norm, which leads to a well posed uh, problem. But the quasi, uh, but, um, but, but the left hand side now in this quasi optimality result is, is uh, with a weaker norm. So we have some kind of weakened quasi optimality result. The only approach I know which is able to overcome this difficulty is going back to Stevenson and Westerdeep and will probably probably be, uh, be discussed in the following talk. So I do not have to go into details here, but it shows a very interesting connection to the um, discrete M subcondition and the H1 stability of the L2 projection into the underlying Lagrange finite element space, which is a very interesting topic on its own with many publications going back to Cosé Tomé. Uh, Bramble, Peschiak, Steinbach, uh, Carstensen, and the most recent result is going back to Lars Diening, Tabia Scherpe, and me, 
uh, where we prove this H1 stability for adaptively refined meshes and Lagrange spaces of arbitrary order in uh, one and two space dimensions. It is very likely to hold in three space dimension, but dimensions, but there is one result on uh, adaptive mesh refinement missing. Um, if we would extend this result to, for example, fluid dynamics, and then we would have to consider projections into discrete divergence-free uh, spaces. And there, numerical experiments indicate this, uh, that this H1 stability is not given anymore. So it's, it's a very complicated topic. And, and that's the reason why we've decided to apply a method which is more or less tailored for problems where the continuous in, uh, problem is well posed, but it's very hard to discretize this. And this is a so-called discontinuous petrov golurkin method, which goes back to ideas of Leszek Demkovic and Jacob Palakrishna. And one of the key ideas is the concept of optimal test functions. Suppose the ansatz space, the discrete ansatz space is fixed, and Y is a Hilbert space. Then we can define an operator T mapping the discrete ansatz space to Y via this relation, yeah, where this is the inner product in the Hilbert space Y. Now we can do the following. Suppose we have some discrete ansatz function xh. Then we know due to the well-posedness of the continuous problem that this supremum over all test functions is bounded from below by beta. Now we can use this identity to rewrite the bilinear form as this inner product. And then we realize that this supremum is attained for y equals t of xh. So in other words, the supremum over all functions in y equals the supremum over all functions in t xh. So if we define yh as t of xh, then this discrete imp subcondition is immediately satisfied with beta being a lower bound of beta h. Unfortunately, it's not that easy because in general, we cannot compute the operator t since it's a mapping in an infinite, infinite dimensional space. Therefore, we have to approximate it. And so we replace this operator t by some operator th, which is defined similarly, but we have removed the continuous space y, or we have replaced the continuous space y by some space yh, which should, however, be significantly larger than xh in order to have a good approximation. Now we have something which is in principle computable, but not very efficient, because in the end, this leads to a saddle point problem of size dimension of xh plus dimension of yh, uh, which is very large, even though the space xh, where we seek our approximation, is very small. To remedy this downside, we assume in addition that the space Y is discontinuous across the interfaces of the underlying triangulation, which leads to a block diagonal gray matrix, which thus can be inverted locally, so very easily. And if we are able to invert the gray matrix, we can reduce this large cell point problem to a symmetric positive definite problem of size dimension of XH. So under this assumption, we have some very uh, nice numerical scheme, which is very stable and can be computed efficiently. However, discontinuous test spaces are kind of untypical. Nevertheless, Carstens and Demkovich and Gopala Krishna gave some guideline how you can transform many well-posed variational problems with continuous un un uh, test space into a well-posed variational problem with discontinuous test space. And their approach then has been generalized by several authors, uh, including me. Now, let me apply this idea to the heat equation. First of all, we want to design a numerical uh, variational problem with continuous ansatz space. Therefore, we uh, reformulate the second order system as a first order system by introducing uh, a new unknown sigma, which equals minus the gradient of u, and this x denotes the gradient in space direction. Um, let me introduce now some notation. A is an operator or a matrix which, which contains all these differential operators here. F bar is a vector containing the right hand side F and zero, and U bar is now the vector containing U and sigma. And then I can rewrite this system here as A of U equals F. Okay, now let HAQ denote the domain of the operator A, that is a set of all L2 functions V, such that A of V is also an L2 function. In the notion of Bochner spaces, this reads as follows it is, a, it is a, the space of all pairs V and tau, such that V is in L2 H1 and tau is a vector valued L2 function, and the divergence of the pair is in L2, the divergence is the time derivative of V plus the divergence in space direction of tau. Um, we equip the space with a graph norm. And now we want to introduce boundary conditions, so the homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition on the lateral boundary, and therefore we define the space HD of A and Q, 
which consists now of, of, of these pairs, where the first component is an L2 H10. If we have such a pair, we can look at the L2 H to the power minus one norm of the time derivative of V. We can bound it by the triangle inequality from above by the divergence of the vector plus the divergence in space direction of the second component tau. And then we can bound these L2 H to the power minus one norm by L2 norms. And these are now bounded by the graph norm. So any function, if I have a pair of functions living in this space, the first component automatically lives in the space H1, H to the power minus one. And then we can apply classical results on Bochner spaces to conclude that uh, the first component is a continuous function in time with respect to the L2 metric, which in particular allows the evaluation at certain times. Uh, and we need the evaluation at the initial time and at the end time. Now let me design the variational problem. Let A star denotes the adjoint operator of A, and this is rather standard. It's, it's the same as for Poisson, basically. Yeah, we, we define the adjoint operator, we define its domain. In our case, uh, the domain corresponds to the domain or equals the domain of the operator A. And then we have our PDE, we multiply it by a test function, which lives in the domain of the adjoint operator and is equipped with certain boundary conditions. Then we integrate over the domain Q, over the time space cylinder, and then we apply an integration by parts, which in the end leads to a variational problem, which is indeed well posed, but I have no clue how to discretize it. Therefore, now I apply this methodology, uh, this DPG methodology, and, and start to break the variational problem, which is an interesting process, but very technical, so, so I make it rather short. Um, I introduce the operator A H star, which denotes the element-wise application of the operator A star, and element-wise means with respect to an underlying triangulation. So functions in the domain of this operator do not have any continuity assumptions across the interfaces of the underlying triangulation. So it's exactly that what we want. Uh, then I do the same. I, I, I take a function living in this domain. I multiply this PDE with this function, and then I apply an element-wise integration by parts, which now leads to some trace, which lives on, 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 the, on the boundaries of, of, of these elements, of these cells in my triangulation, which is a very complicated object. However, one can treat this on a very abstract level and just say that this trace is an element in the dual of Y, in the dual of our test space. And if, this, if, if these objects are smooth functions, then I can write this down as uh, as, as a boundary, uh, as, a, as, some, as a sum of certain boundary integrals. So for smooth functions, this is very easy. For, 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 for not smooth functions, it's complicated, but, but I can define it on an abstract level and then everything is fine. Okay, and so the last step is I replace this trace by a new unknown S. Okay, and this leads to yeah, a bilinear form and gives me some right-hand side. And indeed, it leads to a well-posed variational problem. Uh, mm -hmm. That is my ansatz space and in the end it reads L2, which corresponds to this term times trace operator applied to HD of A and Q, which corresponds to this trace here. Um, and the resulting variation problem is well posed. That is, the subcondition is satisfied, and for any right hand side in the dual of Y exists a solution which depends continuously on the right hand side and solves this variation problem. Now that we have a well posed variation problem, we can start to discretize it and therefore introduce the triangulation first. So far, the triangulation was just an arbitrary partition of the time space cylinder. Now I add some additional assumptions. I want a partition into non overlapping time space cylinders which are of the form time interval times simplex. So in this picture, you see a partition into four time space uh, cylinders, and I allow for local refinement in, in time and in space. Um, now uh, with this triangulation, I'm able to define my discrete ansatz space. The ansatz space uh, reads, uh, yeah, consists of this L2 contribution, which is very easy to discretize, and the trace of this space HDAQ, which is some strange space. However, it has a very nice dense subspace, namely the space V times sigma, where V is the space of all H1 functions which, uh, with zero trace on the lateral boundary, and sigma is the space which reads in Bochner notation L2 H diff, or in the notation of Sobolev spaces is, is a space of all vector valued functions such that the divergence in space direction 
is an L2 functions on the, uh, is an L2 functions on the time space cylinder. These spaces are, yeah, kind of non-standard, but they are related. They are related to standard spaces. In particular, uh, I can use now standard techniques to dis discretize them. I discretize the space V by um, functions which are locally polynomials of the form fi fine polynomial uh, on time times fine polynomial uh, on, the, on the simplex. And being in V means in particular being continuous. So it's very similar to a standard Lagrange space. Uh, and I discretize the second component by vector valued functions, which are locally Rabiatuma, uh, locally constant in time on the Rabiatuma function on this uh, in space. And being sigma now means that they are normal continuous uh, across the interfaces of all uh, across all interfaces that are parallel to time, and there's no continuity assumptions on interfaces that are perpendicular to time. And due to our mesh design, these are the only uh, interfaces uh, that occur in our partition. Uh, and so this leads to the following ansatz space. We discretize L2 space by piecewise constant polynomials and the trace space by the traces of functions in VH times sigma H. Okay. With this ansatz space and a discrete test space, which consists of piecewise polynomials, we get the following um, uh, result. The, um, the numerical scheme is well posed, and we have this best approximation. This is desired best approximation property. In addition, uh, the, um, uh, we have a built-in a posterior error estimator, which says that the error of our numerical scheme is equivalent to this computable quantity, which can, we can evaluate locally, plus some data approximation error. And this data approximation error can be bounded from above by uh, essentially the right-hand side f minus the time average of f and the squared L2 norm, uh, plus some higher order terms. So we can compute more or less every, every contribution here, and, and this is an error. This gives us some, some some bound for our error and allows us to drive adaptive mesh refinement schemes where we find the mesh where these contributions are large. Okay, so before I conclude now this presentation, I, I want to add an, an additional remark. And this remark goes back to a lemma of Diening, Schwarzacher, Strofelin, and Verde. Um, and the, the main message is this line here. We want to approximate the solution to the heat equation U, and we want to approximate it with respect to this uh, energy norm. And we do this by piecewise constant functions, so the best we can hope for is uh, the integral mean. Now, usually we would like to apply uh, Poincaré's inequality, which says that this contribution here is bounded from above by the diameter of, 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 of the cell K, times uh, the second derivatives now of u. But these second derivatives now involve the time, which is for parabolic problems less regular. Therefore, we have to apply a parabolic version of Poincaré's inequality, which can be found in this lemma and reads in our case as follows. This contribution here, this squared L2 error, is bounded from above by the uh, diameter of the cell in space direction to the power two, times the squared Hessian in space direction, and then times the Hessian in, in space direction in the squared L2 norm, plus, and now comes the interesting part, um, the length of the time interval to the power two divided by the diameter of uh, in space direction to the power two, times the volume of the cell to the power one minus two divided by P, times the squared LP norm of the time derivative of U. So what does it mean? Well, if we have a nice solution U, a nice means that this time derivative is in L infinity. Then these two terms cancel, and in the end, I get an optimal rate of convergence if I use an equally mesh scaling, that is, the time length in my cell equal the uh, diameter in space direction. However, if I have a Ross right hand side or bad initial data, this time derivative is not in L2 anymore. It is not in L infinity. It might be, for example, only in L2. And in that case, this volume here cancels. And if I now apply this equally scaled mesh refinement, 
this factor remains constant. So in other words, my numerical scheme will not converge. And in this situation, I have to apply a parabolic scaling where I say, where, where, where I scale the time lengths as the squared diameter in space direction. And this is very easy to implement with, with this kind of measures we've used. And now let me illustrate this with uh, some numerical examples. In the first numerical example, uh, we have initial data zero and the right hand side, which has such a checkerboard pattern, but essentially it's an infinity. So everything is uh, very nice. And indeed we get for this equally scale, uh, equal scaling, it's the optimal rate of convergence. Uh, you, here you see the convergence history plot of the squared residual, with, which, which equals the squared error. And, and, and it converges with a rate uh, number of degrees of freedom to the power minus one. Uh, the dotted lines are the, uh, uh, corresponds to the adaptive scheme, uh, which does not improve anything here. Uh, and for this parabolic scaling, I get a worse uh, rate of convergence, which equals end of to the power minus two over three. Now, the second experiment is, is uh, more interesting. Uh, here I have a right hand side zero, but initial data, which is minus one here, and then jumps to one. So it's not in H1 anymore. And here we get a very poor rate of convergence for the equally scaled uniform mesh refinement of end of to the power minus one over four. And for the parabolic scale uniform mesh refinement, we get a better rate of uh, end of to the power minus one over three. Interestingly, or, uh, and in this case, um, adaptivity helps a lot. Yeah, For this equally scaled mesh refinement, we get a much better rate of convergence, but the rate is significantly better for this parabolically scaled mesh refinement. So this experiment tells us two things. First of all, parabolically scaled mesh refinement uh, is very useful. And it leads to another interesting observation. There exists an alternative approach which uses a uh, least squares finite element method, which goes back to uh, Führer and Karkulic and has then been generalized by Gantner and Stevenson. And in this Führer-Karkulic paper, they do a similar experiment, but they claim that they do not get an improved rate of convergence if they apply adaptivity. So in this sense, this approach seems to be better suited for, for these kinds of problems. Um, okay, so let's come to the last experiment. Here we have some right-hand side F, which is uh, irregular in space or irregular in time. So irregularity depends on this parameter alpha. As alpha equals zero, then F is an L infinity. And if alpha approaches minus one half, uh, this is exactly the threshold for f being not in L2 anymore. And as expected from this uh, parabolic uh, Poincare inequality estimate, we get the optimal convergence rate for f being in L infinity. But for this equally scaling, uh, it, the rate drops to zero as alpha approaches minus one half. For parabolic scaling, we have this rate of two over three as uh, observed in the first experiment. And this rate remains almost constant for all parameters up to uh, minus one half. Same observation holds true for irregular solutions in time. So let me uh, briefly summarize this talk. I have introduced a space-time discontinuous petrov lurking method for the heat equation. It is highly parallelizable and is well suited for adaptivity. I discussed the DPG methodology, and in our case, it leads to a quasi-optimal numerical scheme with a built-in error control. And I've emphasized the use of or the, the, the need for parabolically scaled meshes in situations where the time derivative is irregular. What are yeah, further topics I want to investigate? First of all, I want to, to extend this result, which means that I want interpolation operators, uh, which lead to error estimates that are better suited for parabolic problems. And I want to improve the across the error control uh, which uh, leads to an error estimator, which allows me to decide whether I should refine uni uh, equally or parabolically. Moreover, I want to improve uh, the efficiency of the computation, which in particular means that I have to parallelize everything uh, and to improve the data structure. Yeah. With this, I want to thank you for your attention. If you're interested in the topics of uh, this presentation, you can find them in this archive pre preprint, and here are some further papers I've mentioned. So thank you.